As a certified joeyologist at this point, I feel like I need to address something else that has to do with a Bendy character. This stems from something that Mike and the Meatly both technically tweeted out. Meatly said in a very roundabout way that the Bendy books are no longer canon, and Mike D followed this up, I believe a few months later, where he clarified Meatly's initial point, because Meatly, for some reason, decided to leave it a little bit ambiguous. The bottom line here is that the Bendy books are no longer canon. I'm not going to get into the entire scope of what that means just yet, because that in itself is a topic for another day. I don't know, this kind of makes me want to cover myself in Vaseline and throw myself down the stairs, because this takes out not only Dreams Come to Life, The Lost Ones, honestly we really didn't need The Lost Ones, I'll be real, Fade to Black, and if they're really sticking to their guns, this would also take out the Employee Handbook as well. But this decision also takes out a really big, heavy hitter in the Pendy book sphere, and that would be Illusion of Living. My main concern is now that Illusion of Living is off the table, that Joey will pretty much be straight washed. That's speculation and my own personal concerns. I have a bit of a vested interest already since I really do like Joey as a character, in part because of Illusion of Living and the additions that were made to his character in that installment. I'm trying to look at this through as objective of a lens as I possibly can when I say that Joey is almost 100% gay, or queer at the very least. I say queer at the very least because the possibility of Joey being asexual has also been thrown around based on some of the contents of Illusion specifically. For the purposes of this video, I'm mostly going to focus on the gay side of his identity, though that doesn't negate the possibility of him also being ace, as those two things can coexist and overlap. There are a lot of different layers to Joey being gay. I know we like to joke about indie horror business partners, the evil one, gay for the nice one, blah 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 blah, but in all seriousness, I don't think there was any super concrete canon information in Bendy and the Ink Machine that we got in terms of Joey's identity. This all mostly hinges on something that Joey states in Bendy and the Dark Revival. And I start with Bendy and the Dark Revival instead of Illusion because frankly, it's a lot easier to explain that way. In Dark Revival, we are treated to a scene where Memory Joey is explaining to Audrey where she came from, and also something that we'd never seen before, which was the origin story of Henry. We received confirmation that this is, indeed, just a clone that he made of his business partner to torture for all eternity, which, first of all, that's not straight behavior. Jokes aside, we also get a very interesting line where Joey says that, and, and, and again, this is Memory Joey, which is the memory of Joey Drew talking about Joey. It's, it's whatever, it's all Joey. The real Joey had always wanted a family, but he could never have one. The first thing that probably comes to a lot of people's minds is that Joey was simply too busy or too greedy in his pursuits to be able to settle down with a family, uh, possibly due to the fact that he was very childlike in some aspects himself. There are a lot of instances where his immaturity is pointed out, but I'm not going to go over all of those, Let, let's be real. There are a few big problems with this idea. One thing that is really central to Joey's character is how much he enjoys the spirit of youthfulness. Of course, this is in stark contrast to how much he fears death. His fear of death is understandable. He lost at least a couple friends to the war, if not more, and he grew up at a time where death was just part of the norm. The desire to stay young manifests in some of his continued interests, the carnival, Coney Island, etc., and imagination was instilled in him as a young child by his father, and this concept was something that he seemed to never really grow out of. Outside evidence we do have seems to suggest that Joey does enjoy being around kids, the main example of this being Audrey. We don't really see him interact with that many young kids, so it's hard to tell if this is a simple truth or another one of Joey's I'm lying with a straight face moments. I know Joey got his fair share of teenage staff killed, but believe it or not, Joey caring about people and looking out for their well-being are, are, are not two things that always go together. See Henry and Sammy being poisoned to death slowly. My point remains that this was something that was really important to Joey, arguably one of the most important things to him in his life. Therefore, why did he never pursue it to the fullest extent? We see him go to extreme lengths for everything else in his life that he's passionate about in order to achieve his dreams. Of course, this was through playing leapfrog over the backs of other people who were more talented and more successful, but he still pursued things that he really wanted and he would not stop until he got them. So if he was so passionate about having kids, why would he put it off until he was upwards of 70? That... that doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> 
So in short, I would really, really pump the brakes on the idea that Joey was just too busy to have kids. So then the question becomes, what was standing in the way? This is the part where we start getting more into Illusion of Living territory. There really would have been very few, if any, obstacles for a heterosexual white male who was in a pretty good financial position to just settle down with a wife and then have kids. You know, classic American dream stuff. That would have been one very cut and dry solution to Joey's predicament. This is where we have to start wondering other things because Joey didn't do this when he very much could have. So why not? This all really boils down to one point. Why didn't he just adopt kids? If he was asexual and just didn't want to do the devil's tango, or if he was an infertile man, then why not go with the easiest way to get from point A to point B? Adoption from Joey's position would have been a strategic move that cuts out the possibility of catching someone else's cooties. Not to knock anyone's headcanons, but this is part of what makes me question his asexuality. Not his desire to have kids, but the desire to have kids coupled with the fact that adoption is literally right within arm's reach as a solution, and yet he didn't take it. So, was he potentially missing part of the equation that wasn't a female spouse? In addition, even when Bendy came along, a creation that he viewed as his literal son, more on this later, it wasn't enough to satisfy his desire for a parental role. This definitely had some things to do with the fact that he was a perfectionist and Bendy didn't turn out perfect. The, the whole thing with bringing Bendy to life was kind of a train wreck, I'll be honest. He seems overall pissed at Bendy's existence in comparison to Audrey. Audrey was the person in his life that seemed to really fit the bill for what Joey wanted. At least, what Joey wanted out of a child. We know this because he stopped being a raging asshole and attempted to raise her like a normal person up until his death. I, I say attempt because why were you giving her a broken mug to play with, please, man? Notably, Audrey was Joey's most human creation. There was a deep, deep desire for specifically a human child. Not a dog, not a cat, not a demon, not a monster in his eyes. A human child. Anyway, let's talk about the men. <laughs> To expand my butt cheeks on your forehead. I'm gonna do a butt naked live stream and expose myself. I'm gonna show up to stream butt naked one day. I am gonna run out to the woods butt naked and starve to death. Alright. Here's a brief summary of the second act of Illusion. Joey follows around a detective. Joey follows around a detective. I'll, I'll be honest, that's completely it. This honestly isn't a very important chapter in the book, but we do learn some very odd and very interesting things about Joey that pertain to his identity. Freshly 19 Joey Drew lived in Greenwich Village, and forgive me for not being a history buff, but I did try and do my research. Apparently, this was a largely gay enclave in New York that also took on a lot of up-and-coming artists. Imagine that, a bunch of gay artists all living in the same place. Who would have fucking thought? Greenwich is also where the Stonewall riots happened years later, and I'm just going to leave that factoid in there for now. While Joey is living in Greenwich, a detective randomly shows up at the door of his apartment. He lets him into the apartment for further questioning. Detective Sinclair notices that the apartment is kind of barren, and he makes a dry comment about it. Uh, Joey <laughs> doesn't care for this at all. So immediately we see Joey putting a lot of eggs into the basket of what Detective Sinclair thinks of him. Later on... <laughs> Sinclair sent him a note specifying a location and a time for dinner, assumed to be on business terms as Joey was currently tailing him on a murder case. Beforehand, Joey makes sure that he looks presentable, which, fair enough, you're, you're going to the house of a murdered guy's mother who just so happens to be loaded. However, he gets extremely pissed when Detective Sinclair doesn't comment on his manner of dress. This isn't an exaggeration either. Joey outright proclaims his disappointment, going so far as to point out the detective's own apparent lack of fashion sense, specifically noting that he was wearing a woman's hat. After arriving, the butler comes out and makes a comment on how dinner was already over with at this point. Joey's reaction is very interesting, considering everything prior. So, I thought ruefully, I guess we aren't here for dinner after all. So either Joey was hungry as hell, or he was, how shall we say this, a little bit thirsty. 
Joey does make it clear towards the beginning of the whole Detective Sinclair journey that he didn't want to be a side character or unimportant in this detective story, as it were. This, however, still doesn't explain why Joey randomly decided to tail a random guy for an entire chapter of his autobiography and to entertain a murder mystery that he had absolutely no interest in from the get-go. <laughs> he walks a fine line, like, this whole time, between saying that the detective looks tired and a bit unkempt and all that, but also continues to try and get on his good side. All of this at Joey's young adult age, with little to no outside prompting. That's a little bit fruity to me. It's like deja vu, like I've, like I've been here before. It's, it's like roots! No, no, it's, it's like deja vu, like I've, like I've been here before. Believe it or not, uh, Henry is not the final course concerning the things that Joey decides to say about men in his autobiography. <sighs> Henry's interactions with Joey are very sparingly shown, and as such, we don't get a very clear picture of the specifics of what they were like as friends. From whisperings of other employees, though, and according to a footnote left by Nathan Arch, Joey and Henry were great long-standing friends who had a nasty falling out, the details of which we still don't know to this day. But to further put into perspective how Joey felt about Henry, I'm going to start with a point that I feel like a lot of people don't connect to Henry directly. Bendy. Bendy, 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 Bendy. In Dark Revival, we see that Bendy was made very childlike. This is... in interesting decision because Joey mentions Bendy in Illusion of Living, referring specifically to him as his muse, his messenger, and his literal son. Nathan confirms via footnote that Joey felt as strongly about Bendy as he did about his own flesh and blood son, and considering how close Nathan was with Joey, being his best friend even above Henry, and how much Joey lets his imagination run wild, it's safe to assume that this is true. From Joey's perspective, Bendy is his literal son, not just a simple creation made for the funny pages and the big screen. Now, you may recall that Joey is a liar liar of the pants on fire variety. This comes into play for Bendy's creation. There's an entire scene in Illusion of Living where Joey supposedly created Bendy, and it shouldn't take more than zero brain cells to realize that this simply didn't happen. Henry was the mind behind Bendy, Boris, and Alice, with Bendy, being the, the the character that I would like to focus on in particular. <laughs> because putting all this information together it leads us to an interesting point. Henry created Bendy. Joey viewed Bendy as his literal son. So from Joey's perspective, Henry created not only his muse and messenger, the avenue through which he shared his stories and ideas to the world, but Henry created his son. If we had more of an honest recounting of the glory days of Joey Drew Studios, we'd get a better idea of how Joey got along with Henry. What we do know is this, though. They were great friends according to the people who didn't have a history of lying through their teeth, and we know that Joey viewed Bendy as his son. Quite literally. We also know that he was content to keep Henry on board for as long as humanly possible, so much that he amounted Henry's leaving to a huge betrayal of their friendship. And Joey's anger for this burns on for years. We also know that it was by Joey's own recommendation to get Henry working at the same bookstore that he was working at. Henry was the inspiration and the lifeblood behind Joey Drew Studios, which, despite its Joey-centric title, quite literally needed him to function. The reason Joey even bothered to get into cartoons in the first place was because of Henry Stein. When Henry finally showed Joey some of his work pre-studio, Joey described the moment as the match against the flint, the flame. A light bulb moment, if you will. This burning passion for cartoons and animation only increased tenfold with the inclusion of Henry into Joey's life. Even before this moment, Joey makes the admission that he still admires Henry as of writing Illusion. He smiled with such confidence that I couldn't help but admire him. And I still do. For every salty anecdote Joey makes about Henry in his autobiography, there are almost just as many admissions that his presence was a positive aspect of Joey Drew Studios. We get a taste of his inability to let go, first in Dreams Come to Life, where Joey directly mistakenly calls Buddy Henry while in conversation with him, because evidently he reminds him of Henry in some ways. In Fade to Black, he flat out talks to Henry when he's not actually there. We don't know what happened between Joey and Henry in specific at the end of the day, but filling in the blanks with what we do know paints a not completely straight picture. In summary, 
Henry was a co-worker of Joey's by his recommendation before the studio days. He was the spark in the driving force behind Joey Drew Studios. He was the one who created what Joey viewed as his son, and he was someone who Joey dearly missed after his departure from the studio. At this point, maybe we don't need any other pointers on how he may or may not have felt about Henry Stein. Don't be intimidated, Squidward. Try to imagine him in his underwear. Oh no, he's hot! The first thing to note about the Sammy chapter of Boy's autobiography is simply the title. Without music, life would be a mistake. Interesting opener there, Joey. By the time we get to Sammy, Joey is freshly 30, mentioning that he turned set age recently and that he doesn't like celebrating his own birthday. At first glance, this is weird as hell. At second glance, this is Joey trying his best not to acknowledge the fact that he's aging at all. Joey runs into Sammy Lawrence at a party, where they both recognize each other. Joey recognizes Sammy from his time performing at the Grand Cinema, specifically noting that his eyes were more focused on Sammy's playing rather than the actual film that was happening, and Sammy recognizes Joey because he always sat in the front row. This brings Joey directly to another light bulb moment caused by a man. He realizes that his music department is basically non-existent at this point, and fully admits that it wasn't even on his mind before this moment in time. Sammy, after being offered recruitment, demands to see the studio right away. Joey gives in to this demand, kicks it into high gear, and pretends to have his shit together long enough to keep Sammy invested in the bare-bones shack Joey has held together with duct tape and rubber bands at this point. From then on, Sammy was made head of the music department. Joey takes note of the fact that Sammy's musicians borderline worship him and treat him like a god, a, a, a concept that I really wish was explored more. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, trust me, I get it, but I, I wish this cult-like aspect that rings with the chime of the classic bendy days was brought back into the forefront in some way. There's a scene towards the end of the Sammy chapter that is not only very endearing, but it also shows how Sammy Lawrence directly kickstarted Joey Drew's God Complex. Because a chapter after having this conversation with Sammy, Joey hits us with a, a very... well, it sure is a line that you can say... Quite frankly, I was interested in being God. He also talks about Sammy with a certain romantic charge, saying things like, Sammy Lawrence was one of my best decisions, and making a weirdly specific comment on how his hair was always floppy at the top. As it was, as it still is. Th I, I, there is no straight explanation for there are also a couple details in Benny and the Ink Machine itself that, in light of the aforementioned, also strike me as not entirely straight behavior. In the area before the administration maze, Joey's schedule is slapped up on one of the walls. Sammy is slotted in before Joey's lunch break, where he seems to very much not want to be disturbed. That doesn't really mean anything, but let's be honest. Have we ever seen Joey on his lunch breaks before? In Joey's apartment, there's a list of notes about Sammy he haphazardly scrawled onto a piece of notebook paper. We can make the assumption that Joey wrote this note because of the content and the handwriting being close enough to match previous iterations of Joey's handwriting. The content, though, isn't the interesting part. It's the fact that, around Sammy's name, Joey doodled a bunch of music notes. This, for those unaware, is basically the Joey Drew equivalent of writing hearts around your crush's name. I... I have nothing to add to that, honestly. <laughs> Once we're over the wall, go for the males first! The children we can sell! And the women! <laughs> ah, the women! <laughs> we will always treat with respect! The first story that Joey tells in his autobiography is about his time in the military, and more specifically, a telecommunications girl named Lottie. It's very clearly pointed out that Lottie starts to magnetize towards Joey and gain some feelings for him. Meanwhile, Joey makes it very, very abundantly clear that he had absolutely zero interest in this woman at all. Not only, apparently, does he not have time for girls, but is too selfish for their own good. Therefore, doing a charitable act by not dating anyone, I guess. Gee, Joey, that, that might have been the solitary thing in life you were right about. He ignores the teasing from Donaldson and Eckhart, his two closest military buddies, concerning starting a relationship with her. She eventually gets shipped overseas, keeping in touch with Joey via letter correspondence. 
Joey expresses two emotions after Lottie's departure on paper, one being that he was glad that they wouldn't have any more awkward interactions because of her feelings for him, and the other being that he was glad she was safe at her current location. The primary reason they stay in contact was on the basis of a mystery that Lottie intended on solving. See, before all this, she had noticed odd initials on Joey's boots, and while he wasn't entirely as gung-ho about figuring out who the previous owner was, he does play along with Lottie anyway and try to kind of help her out. Eventually, Lottie's correspondences become more grim, and she really starts getting more down on herself. A lot of men are dying, the women are being affected by this, so not only does she start to lose hope about solving the mystery of Joey's boots, but also the surrounding circumstances of the war are only adding to her depression. So how does Joey, I don't have time for girls, Drew, respond? By fabricating an entire story about some dude and his lover in order to solve the mystery, keep her entertained, and spare her the pain of her depression. Oh, the horror. This may have partially been a self-serving act in the sense that he didn't want to continuously receive letters with the most depressing news of the day, but that's more of a silver lining that comes from Joy making what I'm almost positive was a genuine effort to cheer her up. He even went so far as to include her favorite type of flower in the fictional bride's wedding, a detail he seemingly added just because. Goes without saying, but this effort paid off, and Lottie did get through it all, finding a lover herself and becoming a great deal happier over the course of their letters. But the real kicker to the story is this. Nathan Arch, as I mentioned before, wrote the footnotes for this re-release of Joey's autobiography. As such, he's the designated lie detector for certain aspects of Joey's web of lies and not-so-lies. Nathan specifically mentions that he couldn't find, try as he might, any evidence of correspondences between Joey and Lottie, and that they were possibly lost to time. If this is the case, <laughs> Joey's actions here are very loudly not exactly straight. <laughs> Think about it. Um, Joey made up a story about his time in the military, put a beautiful woman in there, and kept a thousand feet away from her at all times, and he was very vocal about this point in particular. Joey could have just as easily lied about being a chick magnet, but this clearly isn't the case. <laughs> so... What was the purpose of this tale, then? Regardless of what the purpose was, this story was fruity as hell, and I certainly wasn't the first person to notice this. Ah! Uh, listen, this is a doghouse. Cats are not... Wait, a note from Henry. This is my niece's cat, Princess Blossom Pepperdoodle von Yum Yum. She wants to learn TV producing, so she'll be your intern this season! There's another woman in Joey's life who had a much farther-reaching impact. Abby... Lambert. If Nathan Arch is Joey Drew's best male friend, then Abby Lambert was definitely Joey Drew's best female friend. There are a few things that are noteworthy about Abby in particular. To start off, she was very gender non-conforming for the time. Many in the fandom have headcanoned Abby Lambert as lesbian. And while we don't necessarily have any canon information to back that one up, what we do have is this. The confirmation from Joey that she almost never wore dresses. During the scene where Abby and Joey are putting on their play at the Salon, a gathering of artists essentially, he mentions that this is the first time in a long time that she'd been in a dress. She is more often than not seen in suits, sometimes referred to as men's clothing or men's suits, and other garments that are still femininely coated, though never anything dress adjacent. Joey mentions all of this fairly early on, stating the following. She had really started coming into herself by this point, and had even started dressing in a far more modern fashion. Some would even call it scandalous. Today, she was wearing a white shirt tucked into navy trousers with a matching navy vest. Her mess of curls was pinned back haphazardly, and I wondered if she was ever going to follow through with her threat to just cut it all off, as so many young women were doing these days. She also has a bit of a streak of rude humor. When I say rude humor, I, I mean off-putting to other people at the time. There's an entire passage that perfectly showcases what I mean by this. In fact, return customers often thought that she worked here, and she delighted in playing with this assumption. Do you know where this book is? A customer would ask. Yes, she'd reply. There would be a pause as the customer waited for her to help them. Can you take me to it? The customer would then ask, confused at this point. No. It was rude, but it made me laugh. None of this would make anyone bat an eyelash now, of course, but for the time, being a woman with a commanding presence and an atypical manner of dress would be seen as scandalous to some, and probably sacrilegious to others. 
I will admit, Joey does make a sexist comment about Abby to Buddy in Dreams Come to Life. You can interpret this roughly two ways, one being that Joey just wanted to be a cool kid with the proper businessman lingo and he doesn't actually feel this way, or he could have genuinely felt this way at this point, as he was already starting to become bitter and angry with many aspects of, and people in, his life. Why do I bring this up? Simply as a verbal disclaimer for what I'm about to say. <laughs> Outside of this one instance, Joey seems to be drawn towards Abby's differences rather than repelled by them. For this reason, I find it very interesting that Joey chose her as a confidant and best friend. While it doesn't make Joey gay to have a queer friend, it may simply be the result of either having a good gaydar or being drawn to the unconventional like a moth to a flame. Either way, I'm still pissed that she wasn't in Dark Revival. <laughs> I'll give you three reasons. One, she's a female. Two, she's not a boy. And three, and most importantly, she's a girl! I haven't actually talked about the final girl that Joey interacted with a fair amount. The tale of his... whatever it was with her being mostly isolated to Bendy and the Ink Machine. Joey seemed to spend a lot of time around and have some kind of fascination with Susie Campbell. When Chapter 3 of Bendy came out, we had a very minimal understanding of the Bendy universe as a whole and myself included, just kind of assumed that Joey and Susie were together based on her side of the story and her interest in Joey. It turned out later that this was all kind of just a one-sided thing on Susie's end. Miss Campbell seemed to harbor two ill-fated crushes, one on Joey Drew. I thought I was stuck with the check, but I gotta say, he wasn't at all what I expected. Quite the charmer. He even called me Alice. And the other on Sammy Lawrence. Sammy, our, our music director, was also telling me they're working on a new character upstairs. Might require a female touch. There hasn't been any canon information since to prove that Joey had any romantic interest in Susie. Instead of actually genuinely feeling something for her, he used Susie, just like he did with everyone else. So there it is, we finally have an answer to the question. Yes, Joey drew gay. <laughs> I will admit, Joey does make a sex-